Okay, hey, how's it going? Um, so first of all, I hope that nobody sunk a whole ton of time into this because guess what? I don't think this is on the test after all. I may have been a bit misled about that. Um, so I'm going to go through as fast as I can and just give you answers because there's still value in having done this. It, it definitely, um, you know, will help you understand domain. But really more the way this will look and more the way that this will be ass assessed is um, you're going to be given the function rules. So I might hand you an f of x that is a rational function. And I might hand you a g of x that is a radical. And I'll ask for the domain of the function that results from these from these functions and different operations. Um, so first of all, could you do the domain of f all by itself? And I think you can. You know that it's all real numbers except for 3. Can you do the domain of g all by itself? And I bet you can. You know what? Uh, let me spill the beans on this too, because this was something people missed. Um, we seem to be really excited to give you guys stuff like 5 minus x. Um, and so if it's in that form, it might be a good idea to just switch this around. Make this negative x plus 5 instead. Then maybe factor out the negative. And then you can kind of kill two birds with one stone on this. You can use your knowledge of transformations. Transformations are big on this quiz, right? So by taking this function rule, which is not in the recognizable form, and turning it into that form, then it might be easier for you to figure out that, hey, this function's domain is going to be, well, let's see. The parent function, root x, would go like this. But that negative in front is going to take us and flip us over the y-axis. So here's root negative x. And then the minus 5 is going to push us 5 units to the right. So here's the actual given function. It would look like this. This is the square root of the opposite of x minus 5. And if you can think through all those transformations, then it should become quite clear that the domain is negative infinity up to 5, including 5. So there. Um, so that means once you've got those two domains, we can kill three function operations real fast because we know that f plus g, we know that f minus g, we know that f times g will all have the same domain. And I said three, but really it's six because obviously g plus f is the same because that's commutative. Um, g minus f, it's not the same function, but it will have the same domain. Um, g times f is literally the same function, so of course it'll have the same domain. But all of these guys are just the intersection of this of these two domains. So it'll be the domain of g, but with the with the exclusion at three. So that domain would be negative infinity up to three, not including three, and then three to five. So there, there's six functions down. Um, oh man. Okay. Um, now, the more difficult ones are your quotients. Um, so let's put, I don't know, let's put the radical in the denominator, who cares? Um, so what if I asked for f over g? Um, hmm. I think I'm not asking you to actually come up with a function rule. I think we just ask you for the domain. So you know the domain will still be the intersection. It'll be negative infinity to 3, union 3 to 5. But when you do a quotient, you have the extra um, restriction that says the denominator function can never equal 0. And we know that this radical function will equal 0 when x is 5. So uh, this happens a lot with these functions, these quotient functions, but basically just the end point that used to be included is now not included anymore. Remember, if you actually just try to turn a hard bracket into a soft bracket by drawing the thing on top of it, I'm going to mark you wrong because I'm not going to try to figure out which symbol you actually meant. So don't do what I just did. Literally rewrite the thing, you know, take out your eraser, whatever you got to do, but make sure it's very clear that you mean that your domain is this.
soft, soft, soft. But there it is. Um, okay, now um, quotients are obviously not commutative. So if we just switch the order here, then that could be a very different domain. So what if we did G over F? Well, you would still take the intersection of the two domains as your starting point. But now you've got to cut away um, any values that make function f equal to zero. Now when does function f equal zero? Well, function f equals zero, rational functions equal zero, just whenever the numerator equals zero. Again, imagine if you did the algebra, you just set the whole thing equal to zero. You would multiply through by the x minus three, and over here it would cancel. And over here, zero times x minus three would just be zero. So you literally just get x equals zero as the only zero of this function. But that suddenly means that you can't let x be zero. So now you've got another restriction on your domain. So we're gonna go from negative infinity up to zero now, not including it. Then we'll go from zero to three, not including either. Then we'll go from three. And this time we can go up all the way up to five. We can include the five because the five is a zero of, of function g. And having zero in the numerator is completely fine. Um, so there's no reason to restrict five. But this would be the domain now of our quotient if we're doing g over f. Okay, so there you go. Um, and now the big boys, the compositions. So let me make some space. And let me also grab these guys without that five. All right, so the compositions, if we did F composed with G or if we did G composed with F, um, obviously order matters quite a bit. So let's see what our functions would be, or let's see what our domains would be now. Because again, I don't think you need to write the function rule. You just have to come up with the domains. Um, so if we're doing f composed with g in this order, then it's not about the intersection of the domains anymore. It's really first, it's about satisfying the domain of function g, which we said was negative infinity up to five. But then you also have to make sure that you're in the domain of f. And the only restriction on f we said was three. So that means if I take function g, and if I set it equal to three, then the value of x that maps on to three would need to be cut out of our domain. So do not let this equal three. And you'd square both sides. And you get five minus x cannot be allowed to equal nine. Then I would add x to both sides. Canceling that. I now have five cannot equal nine. Um, that is my x. Now I'll subtract nine. And I'll find that negative four is actually the value that will give us um, three, which would make us undefined, which I hope makes sense. I mean, think this through. Um, if we took the five minus x, and if we plugged the negative four in there first, then it becomes five plus four, which is root nine, which is three. Now we try to take the three, plug it into function f, and that's when all hell breaks loose, because we now get three over zero, which is undefined. So we can see that the restriction on this composition is actually at negative four. So we go negative infinity up to negative four, union negative four to five. And this is more aligned with what you'll need to do on the quiz, is actually work from the function rules. Um, let's do this just one more time, but in the other order. So we just did fog, so now let's do goth. And don't say that, I hate that. I don't know why I just said that. I hate when you kids say it, so don't say it. Um, where we're doing G composed with F. All right, again, the general rule is just make sure you satisfy the domain of F first. So right now, I'm happy with any value other than three. But then wait, there's more. Um, I have to make sure that I never have a value of, I better never get an output from function F that is greater than five. Because remember, the domain of G was negative infinity up to five. Anything greater than five, then all of a sudden five minus something greater than five is negative, and then we're non-real. 
so I guess let's take an algebraic approach. Um, x over x minus 3. I need you to never be greater than 5. So I need you to always be less than or equal to 5. Um, how solvable is this? I would still just multiply through by x minus 3, canceling it on this side, and distributing a 5 over here. I get x needs to be less than or equal to 5x minus 15. I'm going to add 15. I'm going to subtract x. I'm going to divide by 4. I guess I just get 15 fourths. So apparently we only want the x's that are bigger than 15 fourths. That doesn't feel right to me. It feels weird. Okay, um, I just went on a little trip down Desmos Lane. And yeah, it felt wrong for a very good reason. Um, so 15 fourths is correct. Sort of. 15 fourths is um, 3.75. And so you can see here, I'm actually graphing our inner function. I'm graphing the x over x minus 3. And we know logically, I think we know logically, that any x that maps onto a value greater than 5, that's what needs to be cut out of our domain. And so graphically, not that you could generate this graph. I, I, don't, I don't think you guys are there yet that you could necessarily sketch this graph. Um, but we can see that 5 happens at 3.75. And so if I'm left of that, we said we said we wanted the x's that are bigger than that. Yeah, the x's bigger than that are good for us because they're less. But we also have a vertical asymptote. That vertical asymptote makes the algebra over here a little bit tougher. Um, and so it's actually only those values trapped between the vertical asymptote and the 3.75 that are bad for us. Anything less than 3 is fine for us, too, because, well, there are going to be values that are less than our horizontal asymptote at 1. So those are all fine. So there's just this brief little window where we're bad. Um, if you're confused by this, don't worry about it, because we, we won't give you anything that's this complicated. Um, but hopefully, given the graph to go off of and you know, kind of seeing it, you understand now that our domain would not be all reals except 3. Our domain would actually be um, everything from negative infinity up to the asymptote at 3, not including 3. Um, then we get this brief window where our outputs are too big, and they will cause this radical to be non-real. So we have to pick up again at the 15 fourths, and then go to infinity. Now I put a soft bracket, but that's not right. It would be a hard bracket. Because the 15, points, the 15 fourths gives us exactly 5. When you plug in 5, you get exactly 0. And the square root of 0 is fine. So why can't it be 3 then? Oh, right. Because 3 causes the denominator here to be undefined. So 3 is bad, but 15 fourths is fine. So this would be the domain for this one. That's far more complicated than anything you really need to know. OK, um, so there's some practice. Um, these are probably big functions to make sure you know, um, a radical and a rational. Um, but what other function types are there? There's linear, x plus 4. There's quadratics, x squared, I don't know, minus 5x plus, OK, terrible choice. Um, can, is there anything even factorable? Plus 5, negative. 2 and 3. Okay, fine. Let's say you had that. Um, you better know your quadratics and you better know how to factor them. This could be an x minus 2 times an x minus 3. So make sure you can factor. Um, logs. I think logs are off the table. <coughs> I don't think we'd ask you about log base 3 of x minus 4 or anything. Although we're getting dangerously close to the day that I would expect you to be able to handle something like that. Um, exponentials, I think, are on the table. If I felt like giving you 3 to the x minus 4 or whatever, maybe logs are on the table. I'm not sure. Um, 
But if I gave you 3 to the x minus 4, I'd like to think you remember that 3 to the x is just that guy with a horizontal asymptote at 0. And then without this transformation, then 0 gives 1. So you know you cross the y-axis at 1. 1 would give 3. So you'd be like here. Um, and you'd get this very quick growth. Yoink. So then the effect of the minus 4 here, minus 4, is just that everybody gets pushed to the right. This was a horizontal shift. Um, so this point that's at 0 would suddenly be over here at 4. And this point that's at 1, 3 would now be at 5, 3. So it's almost like you're, that vertical growth is just kind of delayed because the whole thing got shifted to the right. But there's your graph. Um, you would know that the domain is all reals because the domain of every exponential function is all reals. You would know that the range is going to be um, some number up to infinity because it's always going to be all the numbers that are above the horizontal asymptote, right? So our range could only ever be the horizontal asymptote up to infinity. Well, I lied. Obviously, if there was a negative in front, then the whole graph could reflect over the horizontal asymptote, and then your range would be negative infinity up to the horizontal asymptote. But that could happen, um, so you better be aware of that. Um, I want to keep this video short and sweet. I want to just lay out for you that, yes, this could happen. You've got your whatever, linears, quadratics. I, I think you got to know logs at least a tiny bit. I don't know. Like, for example, when I say a tiny bit, I mean, what if you knew that this thing was not supposed to equal 3? Well, when does log base 3 equal 3? Wouldn't it be at 3 to the third, which is 27? So wouldn't 31 be the guy that makes this thing equal 3? I want to believe you guys can do that math. Ooh, I hope you can. All right, maybe one more time. Hey, uh, what if you knew this couldn't be 2? Well, when would it be 2? Isn't the log base 3 of 9 equal to 2? So when would x minus 4 equal 9? Wouldn't it be 9 at 13? So 13 would be bad. You'd have to cut 13 out of your domain if this thing couldn't be 2. Um, all right, maybe I should show you how to do the algebra for real, for a log. So let's pretend you had log base 3 of whatever I just said, x minus 4. And let's pretend we were doing some, composi some composition with a rational, an x over x minus 2 then you would know that 2 is the restriction on this function. So you'd know that this function must never equal 2. So how do you solve this? Well, to solve a logarithm, you turn it into an exponent, right? You take the base, and you raise the base to the power of the answer, and then you set that equal to the stuff that was in parentheses. That's how you solve a log equation, is you convert the logarithmic equation into an exponential equation. And then you solve. And from here it's cake, because 3 squared is 9. And then it's literally just a one-step equation from here where you add 4 to both sides. And then you would quickly find that 13 is the bad guy here. So what would be the domain, by the way, if this was function, I don't care, m, and this was function n? And if we were composing in an order where m was the inner function, then you'd have to satisfy m's domain first, which of course would be, hmm, let's see. This minus 4 wants to take a log parent function and shift it to the right 4. Logs normally have their vertical asymptotes at 0, so I guess this guy's vertical asymptote is at 4. And then because the base is greater than 1, we know that it's going to be increasing like this. So if that's my graph, then I know the domain of m is um, 4 to infinity, not including 4. Um, but then we just found that we can't have any inputs in this log that map onto 
twos because then we'll have division by zero. And it's 13 that maps onto two. Oh, my pen broke. Um, so cut 13 out of this interval. You'd go four to 13, union 13 to infinity, and you'd have a domain. Um, so if there is a log on your quiz, I hope you'll be able to access the part of your brain that learned this in Algebra 2. And if there's an exponential, same thing. All right, there's already a 20 minute video. I'm gonna post what I have now, and then I'm gonna make an answer key for the other thing and post that too. Um, peace, goodbye.